Hi friends, welcome to the Ian Khan show and you're watching and listening to Aftershock special episode. In this episode and the series, I interview contributors to the recent book Aftershock. My guest today is Dr. Rodrigo Nieto Gomez and he is a geostrategist and defense futurist who's focused on the consequences of the accelerating pace of change in security environments and governance. He's also a professor at the Naval Postgraduate School and a faculty member of Singularity University. Let's speak with Rodrigo. Rodrigo, welcome to the Ian Khan Show. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are here doing an Aftershock special episode. How are you, Rodrigo? Very good, Ian. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been certainly an interesting time. And it's probably an interesting time to be talking about the issues of future shock right now. Absolutely. And one of the things that uh, is so profound in future shock is that it has talked about a lot of things, but I think it didn't talk about many of the things or many aspects of, of our life. And let's talk about that right now. I want to know who you are, Rodrigo. Tell our audiences, who, who are you? You've done so much. I want to see how you see yourself. Thank you so much. Well, I work for the Department of Defense of the United States of America's government. As you can hear by my accent, I'm Mexican born. So I was born and raised in Mexico, I studied law there, became a NAFTA lawyer. So a lot of my companies were either Canadian or American companies that were working in the NAFTA zone. This was around the time in which we were seeing an increase in this bureaucracy in America that we call Homeland Security. I got more and more interested on that side of the things, a lot less on the commerce and trade aspects. So I ended up doing a master's and a PhD in geopolitics at the French Institute of Geopolitics of the University of Paris in France. After that, I moved to America. I And since then, I've been working for the Department of Defense on the intersection between homeland security, what we call homeland security or security, and innovation and technology adoption. Amazing. There's probably so much knowledge in your mind, it's going to be impossible to take it all out. But we're going to talk about some of those things. Uh, nothing confidential, though. So let's talk about Aftershock. I've read your piece. I've read your piece amongst all the other interviews that I've been doing. So I read everybody's piece and then I interview those folks. And your piece is one of the longest, one of the most profound and one of the most timely ones because it talks about the red tape. It talks about policies. It talks about all of these things that the bureaucracy that we're facing in current times and was Alvin Toffer able to predict it? And if not, where are we going with this? You've written a lot. You've written about, um, you've written about uh, the congressional hearing that uh, Mark Zuckerberg had and, and what the response of the Congress was and many, many other things, our relationship with cell phones and devices and technology. How do you, what is your current vision of the world right now? Well, that's an interesting question to ask right now, right? So we are all socially isolating, although we shouldn't be using that term anymore. A good friend of mine, a police chief of the Bay, from the Bay Area told me, we shouldn't be describing this as social isolation. We are physically distancing each other because we need to in order to slow the growth of COVID-19, but we should be connected more than ever before. We need to support each other, right? And in that regard, you can see how technologies like the internet are becoming the backbone of societal interaction, at least in the developed world. The developing world is a different story. So the world today is very different than the one that we had a month ago, right? If we would have had this podcast at that time, and that's probably one of the issues about Future Shock is that it can surprise you in ways that you don't anticipate. Um, bureaucracies like Homeland Security and the things that I work are built in theory to respond uh, to events like this one. How well that response was, well, that would be a matter for many article analysis of the future. So right now, what I see to answer your question is a world uh, that is more and more dependent on scientific and technological revolutions. We are all praying for one particular innovation, a COVID-19 vaccine. We want to get there as fast as we can. And we're seeing the ramp up of uh, innovation effort like we've never seen probably since Second World War. So we are single-minded. We are dealing with the dramatic consequences of an event like this one. And uh, I don't think that we will go back to what we were before COVID-19. I think that we'll come back to something that will be different, hopefully better. Absolutely. And I completely agree with you and uh, appreciate your comment. I have the same uh, thoughts and feelings about the current era that we're going through. I also believe that humanity is undergoing 
a very big stress test. This is a test we didn't call out for, but it has happened because of the consequences of us living in a very complex world. It's a world with free-flowing trade, a commerce, flights, millions of flights taking over every single day. We're very connected. The world today is very, very, very connected in all senses. And maybe that's one of the reasons why the virus has spread the way it has and it's spreading. In today's era, we are also very much isolated from each other because of technology. We are all glued to our technology, our devices, but we're still interconnected. Such a different proposition. How do we fight something? What is happening right now? It's yes, at a, inventing a cure is great. But behaviorally, what should we do in order to avoid any of this in the future? And this goes to the point that I tried to explain on that article. There is an effort to build a bureaucratic infrastructure around this idea of future shock. And sometimes that construction might be aiming at the wrong thing. Uh, and I specifically point out that some of our immigration fears that we saw in the first half of the 21st century uh, that have to do with less technological and more demographic changes, right? The fact that some of the, the global north demographic composition is changing with the influx of people fl from the global south. And we saw that bureaucracy created. But right now, you're completely right. So the ultimate goal in the next two years is going to be the creation of a vaccine that allows us to respond with the most definitive kind of answer that modern medicine can give to a problem. But before that, we have what I think are at least three stepping stones, right? So the aggressive non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have right now, NPIs, as epidemiologists call them. This is what you and I are doing right now. When you're staying at home, away from your loved ones, with the sacrifices that that implies, you are doing a non-pharmaceutical intervention. And it's a really important one because it's the only low-hanging fruit that we have that doesn't require science and technology. We can do it now and doesn't require more innovation. Even there, though, you see immediately how innovation plays, right? So you see how in this, so talk about future, suddenly our time horizons went from strategic plans for 10 years to strategic plans for 10 weeks, right? So, and even there we're getting them wrong, but we need rapidly solutions to making sure that people can have a job and keep working either from home or those who need to be physically somewhere. I mean, what is happening with the a lack of N95 masks, both in hospitals, but also in the fields where farmers are picking up the fruits and vegetables that we're ordering online. We need to rapidly innovate to make that viable. We need to make a society, at least in the short term, that is viable under these conditions, right? Just here in the United States, you, you've seen the unemployment numbers. It's 12 million people without a job like this. That's not sustainable. Right. So yeah. society will adapt. And in this case, government infrastructure and big corporations, foundations have to do as much as we can to make sure that in this short term, we have the tools that we need to do. So and then there are next steps, right, like regular testing, public health breakthroughs until when we get to that vaccine. Absolutely. You've talked a little bit about things such as Uber, Airbnb, the evolution of all of these newer, and I'm literally looking at the book, all of these newer technological changes that have changed how business is conducted. What is your outlook on how do these things change society? How do they change our behavior? Is that something that you're trying to tie in with your article as well and yeah. in your work as well? And you just, I mean, you just said this is a stress test. And I think that's a beautiful thing, a, a beautiful way of thinking about this. We probably should come out of this pandemic crisis with a new structure. Part of that is a bureaucracy I talk about. Part of that is just new ways of doing business, almost with a switch. And so you can flip the switch and go into pandemic mode and not collapse society in the process, right? So there should be a way, the same way every summer, we all migrate to beaches and every winter we move into holiday season. Every time that an outbreak in the heavily interconnected world that we have appears, there should be a way, hopefully regionally and not globally, but to be able to lock down that part of society and that lockdown doesn't mean necessarily the destruction and obliteration of jobs or companies, etc. Uber, Instacart in America, I don't know if you have it in Canada. So all of the grocery shopping apps, they have become the lifeline of, of our society, right? So in, especially in urban environments, when we're asking people to isolate them, these are the services that now with Zoom are keeping our society alive. So it's not only a stress test, it's also an A-B test. We have the 1918 pandemic as one example, and then we have the 2020 pandemic as another one. And one thing that has changed is that we have the internet and we have internet platforms on top of them. So I can assure you that 
after this, jobs that are associated to activities that can be performed even without the collocation in an office space are going to be more coveted. Wouldn't your or your family be more interested in a job like that, seeing what you've seen and being through what you've been through? If you knew that a job can be performed from home and it's pandemic proof, let's say, or or pandemic resistant. So that those changes, I think, will be with us even after we're out of pandemic, COVID-19 hell. Yeah, I think from people perspective, people will find, first of all, I find there's different types of people and their reactions are, are very different with respect to something like that. I've, I'm seeing a lot of people who are doing nothing about the pandemic. They are, they've either been laid off or their business have, businesses have suffered and they're just waiting for things to open up. Many of them will close the doors of their business forever. Uh, some of them are waiting for government aid. Like there's a category of people who are unable to do anything about this at all. They can't move. And it's very unfortunate that it is the situation that they're in. There are some who are trying to struggle, who are trying to pivot, who are trying to find different means of doing things. And uh, there are some professions that have in job titles and jobs and roles that have really become busy, doctors and nurses and frontline healthcare staff. And in one way, you know, when you stretch something, a balloon or, or, a, or an elastic band, it just stretches things in a different way and puts tension and pressure in different places. That's what's happening. I think we've just been stretched like a string or a rubber band and we're trying to figure out where we are going to come back when this elastic band comes back again. But yeah, it's I've spoken to literally tens and hundreds of people. I'm doing a few different things, live streams and conversations and calls. It's just completely different situation. Some places, some markets are completely shut down. What have you seen in terms of shutdowns with respect to COVID-19 and it being maybe a new normal, as many people are saying? Is this how we should live separate from each other? I don't think that in the long term, if we're talking more than two or three years, this will be the case. These two shall pass, right? So now, if for us of us who had the, the blessing of still knowing or meeting our grandparents, many of them went through dif difficult things like that, either Second World War or my parents, my, my grandparents went through the Mexican Revolution that killed the big percentage of the population in Mexico. And you could see how even after decades of that, their behaviors were adapted to that. They would finish the food on their plate. They would know that not everything. And I think some of that will happen now. So uh, I don't think markets will come back to what they were before. And that might be a good thing. We are seeing more innovation in certain fields. Companies that were reluctant to adapt the digital transformation strategies have done more in two weeks than they've done in 20 years before. Uh, businesses that were not uh, multi-channel, for example, restaurants that were so successful that they wouldn't even take take out orders suddenly are struggling. And those who were already on the internet and take phone calls and delivered and were on Uber Eats and suddenly were more resilient. So one of the things that we're learning is that multi-channel matters because one channel shuts down, you still have the others to be able to keep functioning, right? This yeah. continuity of operations, continuity of government, uh, governments who are able to immediately jump to WhatsApp or Zoom with all its privacy flaws that it might have. It's been a lifeline for many, especially small governments that wouldn't have the budget to immediately set up their own video servers and their own. So cloud computing is showing us how much we can sustain operations even in a level of disruption like this one and frankly i mean this is gonna make a big difference my favorite restaurant my favorite sushi restaurant doesn't deliver on the internet my second favorite does guess which one has been taking all my money during this pandemic so taste is just one factor and in this case companies that learn i think that they can succeed under extreme conditions will learn lessons that they can carry forward. That's what bureaucracies do when they do it well. Absolutely. I want to read something from the book. This is a part of your essay. And quote, the global society reacted with future shock risk symptoms to this accelerated pace of technological change with what the media has now labeled as the tech lash. The tech lash is nothing other than a backlash against future shock. What exactly is this? What exactly is a tech lash? Yeah, so you might remember, right? So around 2018, right, we started to see this very big anti technology narrative or politics form, right? It had to do with the quantum analytic scale uh, scandal for Facebook, but it also had to do with the issues of the lack of job security or quality of jobs around the gig economy or the platform-based economy. Gig economy is a pejorative term in itself. So what you started to see is that 
probably the first 10, 15 years of the 21st century were a time of awe for Silicon Valley-like companies. And I'm using Silicon Valley here as an idea, not, not as a place, but high-tech companies that accelerate, that can scale very rapidly. We know what companies we're talking about. By 2018, we were having what I'm, others are calling a tech lash, right? A, a counter-policy movement of people who felt that these uh, companies have flown too close to the sun, that their Uberis was affecting us, that they were changing society too soon, right? So this is Alvin Toffler 101, that their changes were so fast, they were moving fast and breaking things, and that we wanted to hit the break. And the way society hits the break is through asking for regulation. It puts pressure on political entities, and we've seen this one, for example, in Germany or Singapore, where Uber is not allowed anymore to operate the way it wants to operate. And that tech lash was the story regarding technology for 2018. That story is a little bit on the back burner right now because suddenly we need them, right? And we need what they give us. We've seen the conversation, right? We see that some Amazon workers are asking and probably they're right for better protective equipment. We're seeing that Instacart shoppers are being treated as heroes because they're the ones who are allowing urbanites to socially isolate. But I think that we have transitioned from thinking that this is bad as a element of the economy to thinking of how do we make it better but right now they have become essential workers right so uh, that's a big change absolutely thank you uh, rodrigo i love it tell me a little bit about there's so much going on so i want to encapsulate our conversation into actionable points for our listeners whoever's watching this video hoping that they are able to create a change in their life, business, organization, future because of our conversation. What would be maybe say the top three things uh, that you would suggest anybody to do? What should they do about the future so, to be bright? So some of these are going to be tried and they probably have heard them before. It's just that the context has changed. One is General Shinsaki, right? So if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. So right now we don't have the luxury and therefore change is unavoidable. So if you can find a way of making this change work for you, this will matter. Secondly, and this is, there are many people who have said this, but it also matters. Don't let the crisis go to waste, right? It's a stress test. And sadly for you, you didn't plan for it and you didn't want it, but you have it. And you're seeing now where the failure uh, points of your organization are located. Yeah. Fix it. Right? So this is an opportunity. If you survive, and hopefully you will, if you can fix those failure points, you will come stronger out of this one. And third, remember what matters. Right? At this point, this might be forcing us to reevaluate our loved ones, our relationships. Us of us who have been in the startup world know that nine to five is a luxury we don't have when you are building a startup. It's okay. It's a phase of your life. But at the end, the things that matter are the people you can hug and we're missing them right now, right? So, so work balance matters to be successful. Right? Absolutely. I completely agree. I always tell people that change will interrupt you, interrupt you or, or help you grow. And it's how we use the impact of change because it'll keep on happening. Different kinds of change will always happen in your life. Rodrigo, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Where can our viewers and listeners find out more about your work? So, Ian, thank you so much. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn and also www.rodrigonietogomez.com. It's probably, I should update it because I haven't in a while in the middle of this, but all of that is available. And of course, I answer as much as I can to comments from through all the platforms. Alrighty. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for being a contributor to Aftershock and Aftershock is available on amazon.com. Thanks to our friend, John Schroeder, who's put it together and brought us all together under this one platform. Rodrigo, have a safe time. I wish you and your family all the best and we'll definitely be in touch and connect soon. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And thank you so much to you and all your viewers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey friend, this is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at iankhan.com. 